Bless the Lord, everyone. We give God the praise. Wherever time you're watching this, we want to welcome you to the Sign of the Dove Ministries, where we are spirit-led and compassion-driven. And I'm excited about what we get to do today in lifting up the Lord our God. I'm excited that we get to raise our eyes to the one that is greater. I'm excited because we get to really love on the Lord in a way that calls on his presence and brings him near. We want you to know today that God is near to you. And so I want to encourage you to lift up the Lord God. I want to encourage you to cry out his name aloud. Get the kids, gather them all around, and let's praise the Lord together. I was glad when they said, let us come into the house of the Lord. And so we want to come, and we want the presence of the Lord to manifest himself right where you are. Amen? And so come on and let's lift him up right now where we are. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Come on, clap your hands right here. Hey. We just want to lift up the name of the Lord. Look to him as the everlasting God. Come on, help us out and sing. Oh. 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 Sing it one more time. Oh. 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 Song says strength will rise. Here we go. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer.
everlasting God. He is the everlasting God. He will not faint. He won't grow weary. Hallelujah. Our God is an everlasting hope. Wherever you are right now in your journey, in your struggle, wherever it is, I want you to know that you can hold on to the everlasting God. He's my comfort. He's my shield. He's my hope. He's my defender. I'm a living witness. I'm a living witness that he makes a way out of no way. Because he's a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Somebody that knows him, come on. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. See, somebody needs to sing this truth today. He's a waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in my the darkness, hallelujah. my God, that is who you are. This is a powerful truth. Sing it one more time together. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. One more time. Sing it. Waymaker. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God. That is who you are. Come on, somebody that believes in today. Waymaker. Waymaker. Come on now. Miracle worker. Yes, he is. Promise yes, keeper. you are. Light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. One more are. time, sing it. One more time, sing it. Waymaker. Waymaker. Miracle worker. Promise keeper. He's light in the darkness. sing the first verse. Hallelujah. Here we go. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. 
Hallelujah. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. I can say that with faith and confidence. My God will never fail. Because I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle. belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Take your mind off of things and let's look our head up. Let's lift our head up. Here we go. The second verse simply says this. Here we go. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Every war he wages he will win. My God. See, I'm not backing down from any giant. Hallelujah. I know how this story ends. Hallelujah. I know. I know how this story ends. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle. Hey. somebody you turned it for good I need you to believe this today speak the words of faith come on you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turned it you turned it for good oh thank you Lord yeah. you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good What the enemy meant for evil, and you turned it for good. Hey, you turned it for good. Oh, you take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord, because I know you to be a way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are see that's why i know i'm gonna see a victory because i know who he is way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the dark my god that is who you are so 
I just wanted to say this real briefly. I just want to say this real briefly. There's, there's some confusion that has been happening, you know, in our lives, okay? And things have just been turned upside down. And, and it, it just, it, it looks like we're going to fall. It looks like, hallelujah, it looks like we're not going to make it. But see, what we just sang is you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turned it for good. Now, you may not see the good right now, but see, my God is a God that I believe and I trust. And so I believe him in faith that he's working in my situation right now. He's working in it. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean he's not working because my God is always working. He's always working. And because I know who he is, that's why I can lift him up. So I, I, I make a conscious decision to believe what I've seen him do before. I'm going to believe him right there. Because I know him to be a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the dark, my God. That is who you are, yeah. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that we can spend time in your presence. I thank you, Lord God, that we can make this choice, Lord God, to see you, to see, to see the greater. Father, you said in Philippians that we are to set our minds on the things above. Father, you said that whatever is lovely, whatever is just, whatever is good report, think on these things. That's what your word says. So, Father, we make this choice to set our mind on those things. And the reason why you said, because the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind. And so God, I thank you for the peace that has come in right now. I thank you for the peace that has come in right now. I thank you for the peace that's come on this worship right now. For all these members, the peace that has come on them right now. I thank you for the peace right now. I thank you for the divine visitation that lets us know the battle belongs to the Lord. That is who you are. Father, I just lift you up and I thank you. Thank you for being with us. Father, we open up our hearts, Lord God. We also prepare ourselves for taking communion today. Father, we need to remember the work of the cross. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to partake. Bless this word that's going to come forth today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Let us receive Pastor Jason Dewey, after which we will partake in communion together. God bless you in Jesus' name. Somebody clap your hands before the Lord. Come on and clap them right where you are. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. We, we're grateful to be able to worship you today, to be able to be reminded of who you are and what that means for us. The truths, God, that are in your word and the truths that we've seen in our lives that as you've been faithful, God, to be that way maker, that miracle worker, as we've seen you show up in the battles that we have faced in our lives. God, we thank you for the reminder of those things. We pray now as we dig into your scriptures, your word for your people, God, that you would speak and that we would hear clearly. God, that the word would go forth boldly as you move by the power of your spirit to all who are listening all over this world. 
Use this time, Lord. Be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, praise God. It's good to be with you guys again. And I'm excited to continue in the book of Joshua. For those who've been with us the last few weeks, we've journeyed through Joshua, starting chapter 1 and chapter 2, Pastor Corey did for two weeks and two sermons, and then last week we moved in chapter 3 all the way through most of chapter 5. And during that period, those first five chapters, it's really a preparation period that's happening as God's people are being prepared to enter the fullness of the promised land, that, that place that God has prepared for them to experience all that He desires for them to have. And after years of wandering around and, and, and having some struggles for many of them in their faith, we see God is reestablishing that, that connection with Him. He's showing His power. He's showing His glory. Last week we talked about how He led the millions of Israelites across the Jordan. He separated the waters and they walked across on dry land. And so as we pick up the story, we're going to move to chapter 6 today. So they've come into this place. They've, they've actually then entered into the promised land, but just like our lives, after we are saved and God frees us from our sin and our past, He still calls us to live a life for Him. And in this life here on earth, in the world around us, there are destined to be challenges. And actually, there are going to be battles in our lives. And the reason that is, is because even as disciples of Jesus, we still have enemies that we're fighting against. In fact, we could say that there are three enemies that all believers have to deal with in some way, shape, or form. The world, our flesh, and the devil, the deceiver himself. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to dig into each of those enemies and talk about what it looks like to battle those enemies. And so tonight, we're going to look at battling the world. Now, I want to start making, by making sure we understand when we say the world, what are we talking about? It's not just the physical planet Earth but it's actually the, the systems of the, of the world the, that, that are comprised of those who inhabit it, but also the ways that it functions and the systems that have been there that are natural, but they're influenced by the supernatural. Tony Evans says it really well. He, here's how he defines the world. It's an organized system headed by Satan that draws us away from God's love and will. If you would... Look at 1 John 2, 15 through 17. It speaks about this world a little bit more. It says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So there's this battle happening around us because the world, the things of the world are trying to work in opposition to God. They're trying to move us away from an intimate relationship with God. Instead, they're trying to get us to focus on satisfying our own desires, finding our own pleasures, through things that are really not going to be ultimately the most meaningful and significant, but they're pulling us away. Now, if you think back to the beginning, this is not how God intended it. He created the world initially perfect, right? We know the story of creation in Genesis. There was this garden where God wanted to fellowship closely with his creation, with his people, and all the other things that he created. But as sin entered to the world, suddenly what was initially built for pleasure turned into a battlefield where sin and the things of this world would be fighting against God's desire for righteousness and goodness. And so where does that leave us? It leaves us as believers like we know we are not of the world. We, we belong to God. We ultimately will dwell with Him forever. But yet here while we, we are in earth and on earth, 
So we're set apart, but we're still in it. So there's this tension, there's this battle that's going on all the time around us in the world. Now, let's pick up the story and so we can see this connection. So in Joshua chapter 6, we find the Israelites coming to this place of Jericho. And Joshua and the Israelites are facing Jericho, and and I think it's fair to say that Jericho is really a representation of the world that we are still facing today. It's this big threat that's always before them, seems impenetrable, It's, it's deeply entrenched around us, and it seems impossible for us to deal with and overcome the world, just as the Israelites at the time had to feel about Jericho well-fortified city. It, it was a stronghold, and it was this first place that God was taking them to, just as he takes us first into this world to battle and to face it. And so the question then, if, and most of us know the story, right, that they're going to ultimately overcome, but at this time you had to think about it. If, you, if you're those people facing this seemingly impenetrable city, they had to be thinking, how are we going to overcome Jericho? Just like in our lives, some of us, as we look at all the mess going on around us, all of the the sin-filled systems and all the ways that people are mistreated and abused and all the division and all the things that are happening, at times we can think, how are we going to overcome this world? It feels like a Jericho in front of us. Well, as we sang earlier, there's, there's an important thing that we have to realize just, just from the beginning, right from the get-go. We've got to understand, as God tried to show them back in chapter 3 and 4 as they crossed the Jordan, that this battle is not theirs to fight. This is God's battle. If we don't start there, if we don't have that understanding, and that's why he asked the Israelites to remember because he knew that there's battles coming. They have to know, they have to be certain in their faith and trust that this battle is God's battle. See, the, the <laughs> I don't know if you guys sang this song as a kid, depending on what church you grew up, but I think the song's kind of got it wrong, right? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho. I know I can't sing. Well, it's not really completely true. Joshua participated in the battle, but God fought the battle of Jericho. It was God's hand that brought them the victory. They did have a part, and we're going to talk about that, but it was God's word. Read what it says in verse 2 of chapter 6 in Joshua. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. See, Joshua got it, and he told that to the people. We've already seen this happen. This is God's battle. And the same thing is true for us when we think about this world that we're facing and all the things that are in it. We cannot save the world ourselves. We cannot change the world ourselves, and we cannot overcome the world in and of ourselves. The reality is God sent Jesus to do that work already. It already happened. Jesus has already overcome the world. So that work has been completed, and so just as As God spoke to Joshua and the Lord told him, I have delivered, it's already happened. You've just got to enter into what I've already done. The same thing is true as Jesus has already done the work of overcoming the world. Now, we've got to live into that. John 16, 33 tells us this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Somebody say amen. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So God, through Jesus in this case, in both situations, in in the Jericho there and the world now, the, the victory has already been established. But he does have a plan for us to participate, to engage. So what I want us to look at is, what is our duty? See, let's look at what was happening here as Joshua gave the plan at that moment to the people. Verses 3 through 5. Pretty familiar story for most of us. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times 
with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, everyone straight in. That was God's battle plan for his people. And they had a duty at that time, and we have a duty in this day. And I, I want to summarize it really with two main points. The ways that we participate. What is our duty to enter, enter into this battle with the world? It's faith and it's worship. It's faith and it's worship. And we see that here with Joshua and the Israelites, and we see that true throughout the New Testament, that as we face this battle with the world, and we can boil it down to our faith and our worship. Amen. Hebrews 11.30, in reflecting back on this same story in Joshua 6, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. So yes, God had already set up the victory, but it was the faith of the people that enacted that victory and brought those walls down through the work of the Lord. So what does faith look like? What does it look like then? And what should our faith look like? Three words, give you a little acronym to help you remember them, hopefully. CEO, okay? There's a C, E, and an O. Not, not the chief executive officer, but courage, endurance, and obedience. So when we look at the Israelites, and as you read through the story, and, if, and you just think a little bit more about what's happening here, there are some things that we sort of gloss over that these people had as they operated in faith and followed that battle plan. The first was courage. They followed what God told them to do in spite of the potential danger that was putting them in. So if you think about it, Jericho was said to be a, a well-fortified city and it has walls, right? And if you know just a little bit about the military uh, strategies of that time, they would often be on top of those walls so they would be in a position right, to shoot down and reach anything below them. So as God sent the people to walk around the walls, he led them into a vulnerable position where they were potentially going to be picked off by, by the Canaanites, by, by those people that were in Jericho. So there was a, a sense of being vulnerable to attack that required them to be courageous. And I think we can, we can apply that to our own lives because there are ways that when we step out and we boldly and courageously live for God, we put ourselves often in a vulnerable position in the world around us. People will say things, they'll talk about us, they'll question, you know, are, are we loving or not? Are we judgmental? Right? When, when you step out and follow the plan that God has for you to live in faith, there's going to be those that will say things. There's going to be that will question things. There, there's, there's ways that we are vulnerable and God is calling us to live courageously. And I, 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 it's sad to say that I think too often now we're, we're just swayed by popular opinion or what people think or, or what, what's trending on, on social media or, or what the news may say. And so when it lines up with God, oh, it's easy for us to speak out because that's the popular opinion. But what about the things we need to stand up for that don't line up with the popular opinion? That's where it takes courage for us to, to walk in faith and be committed to the plan that God has said for how he wants his people to live in the midst of this world around us that is in opposition. It says, we, we read earlier, we should not love the things of the world, but it's so easy for us to just want to fit in, to be accepted. I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of those people, when they walked around for those, one of those first six days, maybe they thought, man... This would be easier if we just went inside Jericho. If I was just already in there with those people, I wouldn't have to be out here vulnerable and, and facing something. I don't know what may happen. But beyond courage, they also showed endurance. Remember, they walked around once for six days, and on the seventh day, they walked around seven times. Now, this city wasn't the size of Chicago, so the walk wasn't as but they still showed a commitment to be faithful to endure through something that God had told them to do. And for us, let's just be honest again, some of us lose hope after that first three-minute prayer. And we get, we, God, why didn't you answer me? I, I, I prayed or, or I, I skipped breakfast today. I fasted for those three hours. God, why didn't you rain down my answer? And, and we, we don't want to endure through stuff. 
We want, it, we want our answers quick. We want it to be easy. We, we want it just the sort of God to drop things down from heaven or to be like that ATM machine. If we, if we put a prayer in or we put our tithe in and he gives us all this stuff back immediately. We don't like struggle. It's not popular. It, it's, it's, it's not really that even talked about that much in church today. The, the struggle, the sacrifice, the, the patience, the depending on God through, through things that may not always go the way you want them to go. He, he's try, he, they, they stayed faithful just to continue. It doesn't tell us that they complained, and if, we don't know, but I, 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 don't, I don't know. I have a hard time imagining us getting, getting the church to do that today. I mean, let's just imagine we had a, a prayer meeting seven days in a row, which we've done before, and, and we've had some faithful, but we didn't have the large crowds like they have at the Bears games or whatever they do under normal circumstances. To endure, to keep pressing in. The third is, besides courage and endurance, obedience. Another not so popular word. They obeyed the battle plan that God had given them through Joshua. And they followed it. They followed it. They did what he said. And notice, if you, if you read through it, you'll see several references. We know it was seven days there were seven priests carrying seven trumpets. There's all these sevens, which we know is the, a representation of completion. And I think, it's, I think we can sort of make the point here that they were asked to be completely obedient. To be completely devoted. Not just to, well, some of you can walk four days and some of you can walk three days. Or some of you can, you know, you, well, you carry that if you want to, but you don't have to carry that if you don't want to. No, there was a, a complete obedience. A complete faithfulness. See, I think one of the biggest struggles we have in our, in our walk with God today as believers in 2020 is we don't like complete obedience. We don't like complete devotion. We don't like full surrender to God. We, we like, God, I'll give you some, you know, the, the, the good ones, right? We'll give you most of us. I'll give you most of the things in my heart and I'll I'll let you, you know, have influence on most of the possessions that I own and most of the money that I have or, or some of my time. But are we at a place where we can say, God, we've, we've, we want to be completely obedient? God will challenge you. Because sometimes, I'll tell you for me, sometimes it's even just the little things, right? And that Holy Spirit will convict you, like, why do you think like that? Is that God? Is that honoring? Is that loving? You know, and... And I'm not, I'm not saying that we are always going to be perfect, but there's a, there's a devotion, there's a commitment, there's a, a desire and a longing to have God given, to give God everything that we have that he's wanting us to grow in, where we don't have compromise. We see so much of that. Wanting to maybe water some things down and make it more comfortable, be a little easier on ourselves. Or, right? and, and there is grace, don't get me wrong, but, but our heart's desire should be to please the Lord and to, to be like Him in all ways as He strengthens us, as, as the Spirit works within us. But we've got to decide that we want that. No compromise, no complaining. So... Are we living with courage, with endurance, and obedience? Those are just some examples of faith that we saw in the Israelites here and we hopefully will see in our lives. And then it says there was a, as they moved, ultimately they, they ended with this shout. And it's a way of, of representing their worship. And, and what I want to suggest to you that for us as we see what, what the scriptures lead us to, to a life of worship, and we know this in this church, it's not just a song, it's not just a shout, it's not just the beating of a drum or, or playing an instrument, but it's a life of worship. To battle the world, we need faith and we need a life of worship. Let me take us to Romans chapter 12 because the first aspect of this is that we are called to be a living sacrifice. A laying down of our lives to be a living sacrifice. It reads, 
Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. See, when we have recognized that this battle is God's, when our faith is completely surrendered to Him, then we're in that place where worship becomes who we are. It's our life that's offered before Him. It's not just a religious activity or a, or a periodic routine that we go through, but it's offering all of us, our heart, our mind, our will, our life. That's the complete and total surrender that we struggle with at times. And that then builds into what we see in the second verse of Romans 12, which is also part of our worship because we need to have a transformed mind to be aligned with God's ways and God's thoughts as we're living our lives for Him. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. See, even here, there's a recognition that there's some patterns of the world that are trying to influence you. There's things of the world that are going to try to move you away from God's will. And so he's calling them to a process, an ongoing transformation of their mind. The work that is done by the Holy Spirit, but through his word, through God's move in our hearts and our minds that leads us to thinking the way God thinks, to seeing what he sees, where his will becomes our will. And then we're able to see God, what is your will? What is good? What is pleasing? What is perfect in your eyes? That's where we're living into. That's where the worship, it, it frees us to just follow into God's ways. But we must not be conformed to the world and all of its ways. He does this in us as we've surrendered. Notice that progression, the surrender of our life, that sacrifice, then His work allows us to have our mind transformed to think in, like He would. Now the other part of this worship, as we think about this battle, there's a, there's a missional aspect of our worship. There's a purpose, there's a mission. See here, God was, was working to, to clear out the sin, those things that were against Him. And he had been very gracious with these Canaanites. Well, 400 years or so, they had been basically you know, told that at some point there was going to be a consequence for their sin where they would be eliminated. And God was gracious, but he had to come in and, and, and remove the, the worship of the other gods so that his people could pos occupy and possess the land in the way that he desired it for them. And so then, at that time, that was, that was the way that God was working, right? In more of a, a physical battle. God brought, tore the walls down as we read through it. Then we see they went in with swords and they basically wiped out everything. And we'll get into some more of that even into next week. But they had a call in a similar way that we now have a call, even though it looks a little bit differently. They were called to occupy and engage. So as we are in the world, we're not just you know, sort of floating by on the side, but God has called us to both engage and to occupy this world. But He's called us to do it in His way that kind of like this story, it doesn't always make the most sense. Right? It didn't seem to be good strategy to walk around and shout and play some trumpets and somehow this, this city that was well fortified would just fall down and somehow everyone would be killed and destroyed. Well, some people look at the way God has called us the way Jesus has lived his example for us and, and lived his life in loving God and loving others. And some people look at that like that's a ridiculous plan to deal with the world. It doesn't seem to make sense that God would actually call us to engage this world through sacrificial love. See, Jesus started the demonstration I think we, most of us know John 3, 16. Why did he come? For God so loved the world that he gave 
His only Son. So God motivated by love. Jesus motivated by love. Sets the example for us that the way He has called us to now, that after He has paved the way and, and, and died for our sins, rose again, the way we are to engage and occupy this world, this battle is through acts of love. 1 John 3, 13 through 18. It says, Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And there's so many verses I can pick. And even as I was reading and looking at the call for obedience and righteousness and holiness, in, in so many places, if you just continue reading, the context of that scripture goes into loving one another. There's this call for our living sacrifice, our act of worship. The way we occupy and engage this world is through the love of Christ that's in us and goes out to others. Someone said it like this, the world was never an enemy to be conquered by us. It is a battleground to be filled and loved. And so we occupy this territory through the love of God as Christ has loved us. Think about it. We were once enemies to God. How did he conquer and defeat us? Through his love for us. And so we can then go and, and, and defeat that, that which is against God. Not by a power or a strength. God has done that. He can do that. But through his love that is demonstrated through us. So when we worship God in the midst of this world that is in opposition to him, we are proclaiming God's love. We are proclaiming his order, his ways in the middle of fear and chaos. The truth is inside of Jericho, they were afraid. They, they looked strong on the outside like the world does, but really they were afraid of, the, of God and the people of God that were united because there's something that happens when, when people are moved by the spirit of God. And so for us, when we love others the same way that Christ loved us and, and we show that unity and they know we are Christians by our love, we are ultimately declaring victory over the world, victory over its hatred, victory over all of its evil and all of its ways. And we do this through our faith in Jesus and through our worship as we're surrendered to him. And there we find that we're able to live in victory, even in the midst of the battle that's happening with the world around us. So as I close, I just want to speak just for a couple moments to those who, if you're honest, you're still living in the ways of the world. And that's really anyone who has not given that complete surrender to following Jesus. You're still living in those ways. But I want us to actually pick up at the end of chapter 5 before we started with the plan to go over Jericho something interesting happened let me read verses 13 through 15 of chapter 5 now when Joshua was near Jericho he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand Joshua went up to him and asked are you for us or for our enemies neither he replied but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servants? Then the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Most Bible scholars will tell you that this is a representation of Jesus coming and speaking to Joshua even before he had come to the earth because he's the, the commander of the Lord's army. He was receiving worship and he was, it was holy in his presence. So for some of us, this is where it needs to start, even now. Where you recognize and you interact with Jesus and you bow down and you surrender 
and you start that life of worshiping him. And notice, Joshua's question was interesting. Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Seems kind of natural. Who is this person and who are you with? But what he said is, I'm neither. See, God is calling us to his battle. He's calling us to His side. Some of us just want God to join our life and our mission. Or some of us just think, you know, He's there to fight the other mission. No, He's calling all of us into His battle, into His mission. And the choice begins with how you're going to respond to Him. Even now, as you're watching, as you're listening, are you going to respond in reverence? Are you going to respond in surrender and say, Jesus, I I recognize that you are Lord and I want to follow you. I want to give you all that I have. And as that happened, there's this place of holiness as God was speaking through through the Lord and encouraging Joshua for the things that were to come. And, And ultimately, it was a reminder to Joshua before this battle even started that once again, as we started with, this is the Lord's battle. And I'm with you. And if you remain in my presence, I've got you. And that's his word for us today. Yes, we're in the world. We have to deal with the things of the world. But he's with us. And as we keep our faith in him, as we worship him with our lives, and someday, just like this is sort of a foreshadowing, someday the world will come to an end. And our life with God, those that are with him and know him, will last forever. And so the world passes away, but the love of God will never, po- will never pass. But the truth is there's a choice because there is going to be a judgment, just like the Canaanites face the judgment. There's a judgment here that will come at some point. Have we surrendered to him or not? God was gracious with these people, and he's gracious with many of us, all of us, I should say. Rahab responded in faith, even though she was not of the people of God. She chose to put her faith in the Lord, and she was saved. That same opportunity is before us today. Wherever you are, however far you may feel like you're away from God, you may feel like you're his biggest enemy, but God is offering you a chance to come into a relationship with him even today. Let me finish by just reading the rest of John 3 after verse 16, which we know so well. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. God is inviting us to walk into his light, to leave the darkness of the world, to follow him in faith, and to live our lives in worship. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and the reminders of who you are. God, and I pray that you would move amongst all of us, those that need to Make that choice to surrender and commit and to follow you. God, let that be true today as you move through your Holy Spirit and you touch them and you empower them and you save and deliver them. Those of us who we we know you, but maybe we've been lacking in our faith or lacking in living a life of worship sacrificially and completely. God, move us, empower us, God, as we desire to have more of you and to live more into the way that you called us here as light amidst the dark world. God, we thank you that ultimately you have defeated the world and we can trust in you. God, be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Pastor Jason, for giving us a powerful, powerful word. And we're going to take time now to just come together as a family and remember the work of the cross. Praise the Lord. I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 14. Praise the Lord. And I want to come from verse 22. We're going to be taking our elements together. 
And so just gather you, what you can at your home, whatever type of element you have, crackers or whatever, uh, juice or whatever. But we want to just do this for the purpose of remembering what Jesus has done. There was victory in the remembering. Hallelujah. So that's why he's told his body, he's told his body of believers, do this in remembrance of me. That this is not about church. This is not about church culture. This is about the relational component of him sacrificing everything, shedding his blood so that we could be a part of the family. There was blood that was shed. It was his blood. His blood cleansed us. His blood redeemed us. His blood reminds us that he's coming again. And so we turn to the word of God, as it said in Mark chapter 14, verse 22, while they were eating, he took some bread and after blessing it, he broke it. And so I want you to take your bread, whatever you have, I want to take that bread and we want to thank God for this. We want to thank God for his body that was broken for us. He did it. He took the abuse. He did it for us. Knowing what we were going to do, knowing what we were going to go through, he got on the cross. His body was broken. We lift it up today. Father, we bless this bread. Thank you for what it represents. Your body being broken for us. We bless it in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us take and let us eat. then he took the cup and he gave thanks this cup it represents the blood of the covenant which is being poured out for many hallelujah we remember this blood this blood cleanses us completely of every sin every stain hallelujah we are totally cleansed and the reminder that this was done once and for all. No need for another sacrifice. No need for the sacrifice of animals. His blood is enough. Hallelujah. I'm grateful to be washed in the blood. Father, thank you, Lord God, for the sacrifice of your blood, that it breaks the chain of sin. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us partake together. Father, we give you thanks, Father, for all that you have done. Thank you for the work of the cross. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that our sins have been forgiven and washed away. Thank you, Lord God, that now when you see us, you see us through the blood. Hallelujah. Father, we give you all the glory and the honor today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you for celebrating with us today. We give God all the glory, and we want you to walk in victory today. Hallelujah. There are announcements that we have. This Sunday night, we're going to be in the yard again, having a time of worship. It's going to start at 6 p.m. Uh, last week, we had about 30 or so plus people that were out there, and um, it was great because there were even people from the neighborhood that showed up. That, that stayed, hallelujah, and was a part of the worship as well. And so we thank God for the overflow that is happening here on the south side. So please come and join us for a time of outdoor worship. We are social distancing, we are wearing masks, and we also have sanitizer stations set up. But come on out for a wonderful time. If you want to come but don't want to leave your car, you have uh, some uh, reserve parking that is there for you. So you can just roll your window down and enjoy the time of worship. Uh, the whole point is to gather in his presence together. So that's happening this Sunday at 6 p.m. 
And so you can check our website for many other announcements. Um, we also want to remind you about giving. And we want to, first of all, thank you for being a faithful giver to the Sign of the Dove Church. We are so blessed because of people's commitment to the Lord to continue to give to the ministry. And so there are several different giving portals that you can choose from. Go to our website. You can go to also our PayPal as well as our cash app. And so thank you so much. Uh, and may the Lord bless you for your gift unto the Lord. We're also still doing the food uh, ministry uh, with, uh, with uh, Christian Neighbors Church. And so please, we can participate with that. Um, there's more information on our website. So thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you coming in. This is the Sign of the Dove Ministries. I am Pastor Corey Ratliff, and you have heard from Pastor Jason Dewey. We want you to know that the Lord will be with you. Surrender your life to him in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, and God bless you.